Hello and welcome to Spotlight On. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today the spotlight is on Ethan Clift. Ethan and his wife, Allison Clift Jennings, are at the helm of a new venture, Tonic Audio Labs, and are set to roll out their first product, Lumos, early in 2021. Lumos uses artificial intelligence to spark creativity and help artists get unstuck so they can finish more songs. With better quality than a free app, but more user-friendly than most existing digital audio workstations, Ethan and Allison are crafting Lumos to become as essential to artists as the instruments they play. Ironically enough, Ethan and I had some tech gremlins harassing us throughout our talk. If any signs of our spotty connectivity impact your enjoyment of our conversation, I apologize in advance. And now, Ethan Clift. I'm so intrigued by what you're up to that I'd like to break the format a little bit. Okay. Um, and um, normally I like to talk through uh, sort of somebody's background and path and what led them to where they are today. And, and I think we could get to that, but I'm so intrigued by your startup that I was wondering if maybe we could start a little bit uh, with you telling me, you know, what you're up to, what problems you're trying to solve, um, what the technology yeah. is. It all seems so fascinating from what I've read on the screen um, yeah. that yeah. I'm like, I'm sort of beside myself to hear about it. <laughs> oh, awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so this is really our flagship product. We just started this company uh, in January. We decided on one product um, to start because it's such a robust product. I mean, there's so much to build just within that one product. It's almost like building a cell phone and then also building software on top of the cell phone. Um, so it's, it's pretty, a pretty hefty lift. So uh, yeah, so it's, it's just me and Allison. Allison's our CTO and she does everything from full stack engineering to hardware design um, and electrical engineering. Wow. So it's both software and hardware. And um, so thankfully, because this product uh, really covers the gamut, you know, from low level software to high level software, low level uh, hardware to industrial design, you know, which dials to choose the encasement, um, battery, you know, choices about battery power, you know, do we use a barrel jack or do we use a USB-C? Do we use, you know, I mean, the, the choices are really, really just, there's just a plethora of choices to, to make on the design of this product. So, yeah, so we have one product working on, it's called Lumos. And uh, we named it Lumos because we really wanted to develop a product that we felt like would light the way for songwriters. Well, let, let me tell you a little about the origin of the design of the product first. Yeah, because please. I think that's important. Uh, so when Allison was, uh, she was the CEO of a different tech company in the blockchain space, and she was, uh, it was, it was focused mainly on the automated, auto, sorry, automotive transactions. So, uh, you know, cars being able to go under toll, uh, toll road, you know, um, oh, sure. boundaries and pay automatically, things like that, you know, so, uh, so transactions over using the, the car's internal system, essentially. So not using your cell phone or anything like that. So she was visiting some, uh, some of these larger ma car manufacturers um, across, uh, you know, overseas. She had these really, really long um, plane flights. And so she started designing, um, you know, just with her laptop, she started designing the specs for a device that would be um, AI, um, powered essentially but it would be it was almost like a musical instrument um like almost like a keyboard but um it was ai uh powered and you could make sounds and make unique sounds and then you know put those sounds together and and, and create songs and um so she came to me with that idea and i was like you know it's really fascinating because ai you know is so misunderstood in the music industry I think right now, and there's a lot of fear around it and just a lot of confusion around what, what can it bring to, to music without taking away the creativity of the individual, you know, songwriter and the songwriting process. So I thought it was an interesting idea, but it felt a little niche, almost like a theremin, a, like almost like a technologically advanced theremin or something, you know? Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that alone, if, if that was your pitch, I'd want one. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, that's what she said. She's like, I'd want one of these. And I was like, yeah, but, um, 
And so I just wasn't that excited about it, right? And so I've always done sales, marketing, and branding and, um, and ran startups as well. And so uh, for me, I came from more of a background where I, I like to figure out um, new business models or um, you know, change existing business models to uh, solve problems that already exist for people. So say mostly in the creative space. So musicians are making more lattes than they are songs. So, so let's, you know, let's get them more paid gigs, you know, where they're actually getting paid a living wage. So that was my goal with my, with my music startup. And so when Allison and I came together on this, it was like, okay, let's get us to a place where it's something I'm excited about, where it's changing the way that they do things currently and making them so much better that they can't live without this. Mm. That was that was what I wanted to see from this device. So we went from being kind of like an electronic theremin <laughs> to uh, to something more along the lines of a songwriting collaborator. So where the product is right now is it's about the form factor of a Nintendo Switch. Are you familiar with the Nintendo Switch? Yeah. Sure am, yeah. So it's about that size. It's portable in nature. It you know you could take it in your backpack with you. Um, our goal with it is, is really to make it as indispensable as your primary instrument. So if you're used to, you know, carrying your ukulele around or whatnot, um, you, you carry your ukulele around, but you also carry around the Lumos with you. So basically our, our primary goal was just how do we help songwriters finish songs? You know, we know from every level from, you know, from, you know, those, those folks who are just, you know, they they have an acoustic guitar and they have a notebook. And they're always writing their songs in their notebook. Um, from those guys to, to, you know, ladies that are just into their DAW and they write songs directly out of that. Um, we knew that there was a people with technical expertise um, and others without technical expertise. And we wanted to create a device that was, that was powerful enough to help both of those users, types of users, uh, finish their songs. So that's how we came up with the Lumos is that we just decided it was just going to be a songwriting device. That's it. Um, and so, yeah, what would tell me, tell me what you'd like to know about it in particular. Yeah, I mean, um, you've said a few things that um, I don't want to make any assumptions about. Okay. You said it's AI powered. Yeah. Um, you said it yeah. helps finish songs or it's a songwriting collaboration tool. Um, yeah. What does that imply? Like, is it, is it giving you yeah. writing prompts? Is it actually saying, oh, I see you've gone from uh, one, four, five, now you need a bridge or, you know, what, yes. what's, the, what's the thing it's doing for you? Yes, so that's a great question. So there is, there is we kind of broke down the songwriting process into like left brain processes and right brain processes. And the right brain processes are, the creative part, like like thinking of a ly lyrics, thinking of a bridge, thinking of a melody, things like that. Um, and one of the things that we noticed when we, we did a bunch of customer development interviews with different types of songwriters. And when the, the folks that were really into using their DAW for, for writing songs, what was taking them so long and the reason why they would get so stuck is that they weren't great at the right brain side of, of writing songs. They're really good at the left brain, like finishing the song. It's kind of like a producer. Like I know, I know that I need a bridge. I know that I need a chorus. I know that I need some sort of rhythm. Um, and they knew all, they were always thinking in that sort of left brain, like finish it sort of task minded processing. Um, and that was like holding them up from actually being creative and use, utilizing the right brain. So, hmm. so what we decided was that we were going to create something very, very simple, unlike a DAW where you'd have to relearn another system. Like nobody wants to relearn another, another system. So the user interface had to be super intuitive, something that you could pick up and, and understand how to use pretty much right away. So something that was similar to other tools you've used in the past maybe, um, like your phone. So we decided on a, a touch screen that was about seven inches uh, across. And then we have uh, four knobs, so we have, uh, or dials, if you will, one on each corner, and then we have three buttons in between those dials on, on each side. Um, and so we keep it as simple as possible. 
Um, and to compare it to something, um, I don't know if you've, are you familiar with Teenage Engineering's OP1? Have you ever heard of that device? No. In fact, I was, okay. I was going to tell you that I have some familiarity with, I, I was going to try to hold up my laptop. I'm sitting in my home studio right now. So I have my keyboards yeah. over there. I have a DAW on this very same laptop, but um, yeah. I'm not as much of a gearhead. Um, I, I'm basically a couple of synthesizers into a box kind of person. I don't know. Yeah, have a bunch yeah, of yeah. Okay. Things, so. Okay. So, so this, you would appreciate, I think you'd appreciate the, what Teenage Engineering's done, but it's, it's essentially, um, it's just a super well designed, like, um, it's basically a synthesizer. There's sounds in there. There's ways also you, you get a radio frequency so you can like record the radio. Um, there's only four tracks. But what's interesting about it, it's, it's really uniquely designed. Um, in fact, they, they sell like MoMA sells it in their gift shop online. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's like, it's really, really novel. And, and the buttons, you know, just have like a quality to them. Everything about it just, it, it, it seems really thought, well thought out, right? And so we were really inspired by what they had done. Um, but the, we would, you know, we, we bought one because we had to try it, of course. <laughs> and they, they had become so popular uh, when they first sold it. It was like $7.95, I think, or something like that. And then now they, have to, now they sell it for $13.95. So, I mean, very rarely do you see something go up in price, right? Yeah, right, right. With the decimal point after the five. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so their product was, is, a, is a great example of something that it's, it has the same form factor. It's, it's portable dice. Um, their battery power lasts forever, it seems, like two days. Um, and it's really fun to play with. Very unique sounds you can create out of it. But one of the things that, was, that I found frustrating is that it, it literally, like, you have to learn a new system, kind of like, you know, learning a DAW or something like that. Like, like there is still a, like an element of what we call menu diving, you know, where, you know, you have to shift each button has like three different functions and you have to press shift or you have to do, you know, you have to do multiple things and kind of understand how the whole system works. So we wanted to avoid that if we could, because we want people to get the device, unbox it and be able to get started right away. Right. That's the goal. We don't want them to have to do take, you know, spend eight to 12 hours doing tutorials to even figure out how how to put together a song. So, so part of our device is the user experience, which is all the things you described, you know, like kind of like um, setting up prompts, you know, giving them options on, you know, structures of songs. So, you know, you know, this is the typical maybe Beatles song structure. Do you want this structure or a different structure to start with, right? So you start with templates. And then uh, the AI powered part is, I would say that it's not the most important feature of our product. I would say the most important feature of our product is really, um, it's really best illustrated um, by sort of a, I have an axis of, of two different factors. One is, you know, ease of use. Um, how easy is it to use? And then how high of a quality output can you get out of it? And so we went for the highest quality output uh, with the highest ease of use, essentially. And so like a DAW would be high quality output, even higher than what we can create in the Lumos, but very, the ease of use is, is not very high, right? So, so Just for to us... the metaphor or the analogy for one second, and, a, and sort of like a toy would have very, very uh, high ease of use, but low output. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we didn't want it to be quite a toy, right? We wanted it to be fun and engaging. And we wanted it to be something where, you know, you can brush your teeth in the morning, come up with a riff maybe that you want to throw into, you know, um, one, you know, section of the song. And then maybe you come back in the afternoon and you add another, you know, another section of the song. But you can do it in small increments. You don't have to sit down like you do on your DAW for three or four hours we want it to be, you know, easy to use, easy to collect things. So like, so one of our, we, we always joke around that our biggest competitor is not a, not a DW. It's not, um, you know, it's not GarageBand. It's not, it's not any of these apps that do, you know, AI accelerated sort of melody making. It's, it's actually voice memo on your phone. Yeah. I thought you were going there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, so, so many of our interviews, you know, we would have these musicians that would be like, I have 20,000 voice memos on my phone. 20,000. 
I'm like, I don't even know how I would go back to find, you know, a riff that I had created, you know, eight months ago or even a week ago. Like it's, yeah. it's very, very hard to categorize and organize and, and then to bring those things to co- completion. Like, you know, you have a chorus from four months ago and then you have maybe, you know, a bridge, you know, that you wrote two months ago. How do you find those and put them together? And so that was really at the core of kind of where we started was how can we be more effective at helping songwriters than voice memo? Cause that's what they're using right now. And I, I always use this example. I'm not a huge Taylor Swift fan, but I, I am a fan of how prolific she is and how, how much she's been able to evolve over the years. And she has this really cool working relationship with Jack Antonoff uh, the producer and he, you know, he's in his Brooklyn studio and she's wherever she is in LA or wherever. I don't know. Somewhere fabulous. <laughs> Somewhere fabulous. Yeah. One of her house, 10 houses or whatnot. And so she's sending him over tracks. It's crazy. So she's either, you know, recording them in voice memo on her phone or if she has like chords that she like, she likes, she'll videotape her, like just use her video on her iPhone. Um, and, and videotape her hands playing those chords and send it over to him. Um, and so it's just so, it's such a crude tool for what they're trying to do. Um, and so we figured instead of them, you know, sending back and forth files on Dropbox or texting over videos or things like that, why not create a very simplistic structure, um, and an interface where they can just build out the song, um, and collaborate where they're sending across, you know, filling out the parts, different parts back and forth. Um, and of course it's updating over the web. And then, uh, and then by the end, you know, they have a song that they can then output into their DAW uh, where they can track it and, and, you know, master it and edit it and all those things. So, so the finished product isn't meant to be perfect. And to, you're, you know, you're meant to finish a song. Um, and to be able to get all of those ideas into the song, into one place and together into, you know, taking all those disparate parts to, and putting them together into one song that you can then, um, you know, shoot off to, you know, maybe your producer or, or your engineer or, or, you know, just back to your laptop or whatnot. So, yeah, the, the two, the two analogies um, that come to mind when you were first speaking, it sounded very similar to um, screenwriting software. Um, I don't that, know about screenwriting software. What do you mean? Like, you know, I, uh, I forget the name of the, um, the sort of predominant program, sort of like the, the pro tools of screenwriting. Um, yeah. I could dig it up. But anyway, yeah. you, know, you launch it and it's like, I want to write a sitcom, a sitcom or, yes. um, you know, uh, a, a telenovela or... Yes. Um, you know, what have you. And then it has all the structure of, um, you know, the commentary, the stage direction, the dialogue, cut uh, notes. Um, yes. So uh, there was that. But then there's also an element of sort of sketch, of a sketch pad, it sounds to a certain extent, like a, 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 just a place to store your, 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 your fully or par- partially formed thoughts that are organized, shareable, um, can be demoed. Um, if I'm, if I'm grasping what you're saying correctly, yes. I guess a couple of the questions I have specifically about the, the hardware device, what are, what does it yeah. have for inputs and outputs or is it a self-contained, you know, does it interface with my laptop or my equipment stack or both? Like, yeah. It- so both actually, you can interface with your laptop um, and you can, you know, export and import, you can import sounds, say you have patches or, or things that you've downloaded that you want to that you want to put into it. Um, our our goal for the first, you know, we're doing this Kickstarter in February, and for the first round of devices, um, the software that we're really trying to get right, and this, uh, I'm sorry, the software feature we're really trying to get right is this AI melody maker essentially. And so. Um, one of the things that I think people get a little nervous about when they think of AI is, you know, if I use some sort of AI tool, is it going to, am I cheating? First of all, like, is it going to make me so good that I'm going to feel like I'm cheating? And is it going to be, is it going to be similar to what other people are making? 
you know, am I going to be, are there going to be copyright infringement issues? Am I, um, you know, am I going to, am I going to create something that somebody else could. Uh, is it like a stock create? song type sound or something? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, um, so one of the ways that, you know, I illustrate that like, no, not all. In fact, you know, our models, our AI models require you to input something creatively yourself. So whether that's plugging in your, you know, quarter inch um, and playing a guitar lick and, and, then, and then the AI uh, melody maker goes from there, right? You put that into the AI engine essentially, and then it will come out with several options of how to finish that melody based on what you give it. Um, so you can do that it that way. You can do it. Um, so those four those four dials I described, you know, one at each corner. The two bottom ones um, are right next to the microphones. So there's a microphone on each side on the bottom, and those microphones actually pick up tapping. Um, so you can actually basically like like a drum pad. You can tap out a beat um, on those those dials. Oh, wow. um, and the microphone will pick it up, which is cool. So those dials kind of have a multi-function, um, those bottom two dials, which is, which is kind of uh, clever, I think, of Ali. Um, and then another way, I mean, you could just hum in a melody, right? Like some riff that, you know, you just came up with while you were driving in L.A. traffic or something, you know? Um, and so, the, and, and, you know, people are doing this already, like I said, with voice memos. I mean, they're driving in traffic and they're just... They've got their cell phone and they just press record. So that was one of the features that we knew instantly. Like we had to have an instant record button. It, ha it just had to exist. So, you know, you can instantly record, you know, the machine's on, you can instantly record without having to go into menus or, you know, different things. So, yeah, so, so really our, 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 our first feature that we're going to be testing in a couple weeks, we're going to be using the, um, we're just going to be using like a general, uh, web interface to test it. Although the chip that is on the device, and one of the reasons why we actually chose to design hardware rather than just creating an app or a web app, um, is that the chip actually on average is, is, is making the AI models run 20 times faster than the chip in, in, a, in, your, you know, in your phone or um, on your laptop. So, so that was very important to us is to have that hardware element to it. Um, and yeah, so we're going to be testing this Melody Maker, which is our first, really our first, the AI feature that we think is the strongest. Um, and, and really what we're looking for is just for people to experience that magic, right? One of the things, you know, when you're writing a song, you know, without collaborators and, and especially with COVID, we don't have people, you know, we're not just hanging out in rooms with even with bandmates right now, really is that you don't have somebody pushing off of you. There's no, there's nobody pushing back on your ideas. And this, this affords you that ability to, you know, put in something, get a response back. And even if you don't love the response, it is a response, right? And yeah. to what you've put out there and it can give you ideas on a different direction to go perhaps. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of, that's sort of the bread and butter right now that we're, that we're really dialing in is that melody maker. Um, but, but the rest of the device is really, it's, it's not special. There's nothing technologically special about it, right? It's a lot of feeding you prompts. Um, it's a lot of, you know, nudging you, a lot notifications, a lot like, you know, social media does. It's a lot of like, almost like psychologically playing around with, with some ideas around how do you, how do you inspire songwriters to stay motivated? You know, some ideas around motivation um, and the psychology of motivation. And that's what I get excited about. So, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a combo that the technology is cool. The AI is cool. Um, and, then, and then just how do, we, how do we really get musicians and creatives to really finish songs and wrap them up in a bow, you know? Yeah. What's been the, um, the more difficult mountain to climb, the hardware or the software? So it's interesting. So the hardware... We, our friend Kareem, he's at the Abbey Road uh, Red Innovation Lab. It's like an accelerator program. He, he was bugging us for, you know, a couple of weeks, just, you know, hounding on this idea that why don't you just create an app, you know, an iPhone app or a web app or create software, much like much less risk, right? Um, and we kept it's audacious. Creating hardware is audacious. I mean, 
to it, press. Yeah, it, it is, right? It is, it is. Um, but here's the thing is that um, Allison, Allison had come from a background where she had created um, a microcontroller device for uh, the hobbyist market. So there were these microcontrollers that you could use to control anything. And her idea came out of, um, she was, we had these raised garden beds and she was trying to figure out how to automate them. Um, you know, and, and Rainbird and all these guys, they didn't have, they weren't super specific on how to automate them. There wasn't really customizable. And of course she's an engineer, so she had all these ideas, right? Um, so she created, ended up creating this platform really um, of hardware devices. And then, um, and then uh, you know, sort of designing different ways for those, those, they called them Pinocchio scouts, these little hardware devices. And they would work together and you could put them together and, and build almost anything that you wanted to automate. It was an internet of things sort of uh, gadget. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so they, they did pretty well. They had a Kickstarter. They raised about 105 K on it. And, um, and they kind of became a darling in that space. Like they would get orders, random orders from like all these research, like, like SpaceX would order from them or, you know, just a lot of really, really nerdy researchers would really enjoy this product. But the, the maker market itself was not a big enough market. And they had taken, uh, they had taken VC funding. And so, you know, VCs want you to grow or die. There's no in between, right? So there was no way to really keep this company as a sort of a, you know, a lifestyle business, if you will, or a small, you know, a small business. Um, so they actually ended up pivoting into the, um, into more of a commercial space um, and uh, industrial space rather. And so, uh, so they did the similar things, but they ended up using blockchain and, and some, um, some creative solutions to, um, you know, exchanging value over the internet, et cetera. So um, using these internet of things devices. So, so basically this is, this took her on this like seven year journey of, of, designing hardware herself and it's funny she was not a hardware designer before this um mm. but she just failed and you know i mean there were days where she would you know it, even if we've been in this house for 10 years and she would i can just remember her at the kitchen table you know telling me to walk three blocks away with this device and seeing if she still <laughs> had you know um connection you know i mean and then she would, she would, you know, she'd be fixing bugs. It would take her like 48 hours to fix a bug. And, but it was just this constant, like, you know, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error until she just made it work, you know? Um, and it was really kind of miraculous because not being a, she wasn't an electrical engineer. She was a software engineer by trade. So I think through that process, she really learned um, a lot about how to put together a hardware device. Um, and what what to build yourself and what to buy off the shelf, right? So that's one of the one of the biggest sort of um, sand traps that you can fall into with designing hardware, is that a lot of hardware designers want to build everything themselves. They want to build a custom board. They want you know everything custom, and um, and that's great. You can get really dialed in that way. Um, but you can also there's also so many things now that you can buy off the shelf. Like, for example, we're using a Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi is practically a computer, you know, on a small chip. Yeah. Um, you would have to write all of that, right, all of that code and build that entire, like, like that's not what we're building. We're building this device, right? So we don't want to rebuild a Raspberry Pi. We want to build, we want to focus on the things that we're good at, our core competencies. So, what I think, so there's commodity um, elements that what go I think into she's really learned hardware. hardware. Yes, yes, precisely. And I think that's really what the last seven or eight years has taught her. And so for us, we looked at it as um, that's where her genius lies, is in connecting those elements, is in understanding systems and understanding, being able to research, you know, the battery, being able to research, you know, sort of the nucleus of it or the, the main board, um, and being able to figure out sort of what contingencies exist to make those systems work together um, and to do it efficiently and to do it, you know, um, to keep our bomb costs low enough that we can make a profit when we sell the product. 
Um, all of those things are things that she's learned over the last seven or eight years um, at the startup that she ran. So, yeah. so for us, it was kind of a no brainer. We were like, you know, our core competency really has been in building um, hardware for the last seven or eight years. Um, if, if it was seven or eight years ago, we would have done just software because that was, that was her core competency then, right? Being a full stack software engineer. So, so yeah, so it's, it's a real, it's really been fun because she also has to catch up in some ways on the software side because she had moved into a role. She was CTO of this last company she was at, and then she ended up moving into the CEO role. So it's a lot more management, you know, money, you know, money vision team sort of stuff. Um, so, so there's things like, you know, uh, some of the user interface uh, tools that she's using now weren't even around, you know, UJS wasn't even around back then, seven or eight years ago. So, um, so it's really fun because we get to learn also while we're going, you know, um, and then we get to combine that sort of with the entrepreneurial skills that we've, we've built over, you know, the last 20 years of building businesses and, and such. So, uh, yeah, so that's why we went with hardware and it is, it is to answer your question, it is a huge lift. Um, it, it is much larger than the software element. Um, but the software element has its own challenges that are, are, really unique, which is that we're trying to solve a problem that has been around for, you know, centuries, right? Like people have been writing songs for eons, right? So if that interface isn't just right um, and doesn't, you know, doesn't understand the psychology of creativity, of, of the creative mind, um, and combine that with the finishing skills and the left brain sort of, you know, process oriented, um, producer type skills, if we can't combine those two under one roof, um, we're going to struggle, you know, in the marketplace, like we just will, yeah. that's, yeah. you know, so, so yeah, so to your question, I guess it's both, both are difficult. The hardware one is just a lot more work. It's a lot more boxes to check off and a lot more, yeah. um, you know, she had, she's been drawing the schematics for the board and then she's got to get pricing on all the parts. And then, you know, it's just a lot of, uh, of um, yeah, just very detailed work that you have to get right. And the lead times are a lot longer than software. Um, you know, there's always contingencies like, you know, if, if this part, you know, if this part runs out, you know, are there two or three other parts that are being made by other, right. you know, manufacturers that we could depend on so that we're not late on our, you know, delivery times, um, things like that. So you just, uh, I don't envy her position. <laughs> just <laughs> um, when, um, yeah. uh, just to sort of go underneath the hood a little bit in the process or, or, or about the process of designing, de designing a device, the hardware from yeah, the ground up. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the schematic, you mentioned, you know, there, there's, there's, there's certain pieces that I guess are, are very process driven, but when you're yes. prototyping, how yes. do you, um, not, not, not how does one, but how did you guys, how did the two of you, um, approach prototyping? Were you soldering? Were you yeah. flipping stuff out? Like what, how did yeah. it actually come to be that you ultimately held something in your hand? Yeah. I mean, like I said earlier, I mean, it, it's really, it, it's really so in her wheelhouse to be able to find, I know very few people that can do this and I don't, I don't know why she's wired this way, but, but um, you know, she can go on Alibaba or she can go, you know, she had a couple of vendors that she worked with, with her last company that um, she can go to them and say, you know, I need a screen. I need a touch screen. It needs to be around this size. Um, and then they will, they can shop with their, you know, their manufacturers in China. And then they can come back to her and say, you know, like Arrow, for example, um, they they have a great relationship with her from her last company. She can go to Arrow and say, you know, I need these really specific parts. Do you have them in stock, et cetera? Um, and then they can ship her samples, basically. And then, uh, so, so basically, say we'll start with a screen, and then we have to have an enclosure, right? Um, she 3D prints. She designs the enclosure, 3D prints it in her office. Um, she then, uh, you know, she gets... Uh, 
there's all sorts of developer kits that they'll send out um, for different things. Like uh, Google has a coral board. We're not going to be using that. We're going to be using the Raspberry Pi. But that's an example of something where she got the developer kit. She bring, you know, it, it gets shipped to her. She um, solders it onto her board, her breadboard, essentially. Um, and then same thing happens with her battery pack. You know, like she she orders a battery pack. She makes sure that schematics work with work with the Raspberry Pi, et cetera, et cetera, plugs it in, solders it, you know, tests it. Um, she has a lot of testing. So, um, you know, there's heat sensors and, and just all this really, really nerdy yeah. electronics test equipment that she just has in her, she has a hundred square foot office, you know, but the but technology now has made it so that she can do all that in a little tiny office, you know. So she prototypes in her office, which is in our house, and um, and yeah, she solders, she does, she does all that. So um, it's really funny. She got an oven, um, a reflow oven that she she ordered uh, from China, and um, you know, because we're doing everything, you know, you're on a budget, right? So you're doing a startup, and you're, you know, you want a prototype, and you don't want to mess up too many times because you don't want to be buying, you know, ten screens or, you know, you you want to get it right as you know, quickly as possible. And um, so she has these reflow ovens because at a certain point, the chips get so small that soldering them, um, you just end up breaking things because your, your fingers are just too fat, you know? It's just not, <laughs> you're not at the at the scale you need to be, right? And so there's a way for these chips to, to be put onto the board with these reflow ovens. Um, and they're like, yay big, you know? They can fit it on a desktop, basically, like on top of your desk. And... Um, but she ordered one from China because it was just, it was a much more inexpensive version. Um, but she'll find, you know, like some tutorial online that tells her, you know, just so you know, or some review that says, you know, they put duct tape in it. So when it heats up, your whole entire house smells disgusting. Like, so before you heat it up for the first time, take that duct tape out and put in heat, um, you know, basically like heat sensitive tape. Um, and then it's a great, you know, it's a great reflow of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Other than the toxic chemicals it burns off, yeah, it's great. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, who knows what those chemicals are doing to you. So, um, but it's things like that that she just figures out and is real, able to really um, quickly sort of, you know, find her way in a way that's efficient and um, cost effective so that we can prototype as you know, rapidly as possible. And to date, have you, uh, have you bootstrapped all this? We have, yeah. So we, um, we have totally bootstrapped. We, we had saved some money from our last two companies. Um, and so we've been living off of savings essentially since mm. around January. Um, yeah, and just entirely bootstrapped. So I would say, you know, we've, Besides not having our, our uh, regular salaries, which was, is a lot bigger than our actual investment, cash investment that we've used so far on prototyping and things. Um, so, yeah, so I think, you know, besides the, you know, not having our, our salaries, um, I think we've only, we put in less than 20K so far. Um, Get out of here. Into all wow. the prototyping we've done. So, yeah, so we've been pretty efficient with our capital. That's amazing. Um, yeah, we're really proud of that, actually. Um, yeah. So. Well, I'm curious. Um, you mentioned Kickstarter for February. Um, yeah. And it sounds like um, at least one of you, if not both of you, have had some experience um, launching a product that way. Um, I haven't heard a lot about Kickstarter in the last maybe year or two. I'm kind of yeah. surprised that I haven't heard a lot during the pandemic. I would think there'd be a lot of makers and creative people launching projects. Um, yeah. But that's just me being a focus group of one. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about that? So what milestone do you need to hit in order to launch the campaign? Um, you know, do you need to be holding what a beta prototype like where do you yeah. need to be to be confident launching and then what happens you put up a campaign and then yeah. like what do you need like what has to happen funny like a lot has changed since ali did the indiegogo campaign you know eight years ago or what whatnot um there's like an entire economy within the crowdfunding space so everything from like consultants to agencies that 
um, have really dialed in, you know, the sort of cross marketing stuff and um, affiliate marketing and uh, Facebook ads, Google ads, like a all professional those class of sort of like advisory services for yes. bring something to market through crowdfunding. Yes, a hundred percent. And you can tell too, if you've been on like Kickstarter lately, you can just tell in the quality of the videos, there's sort of like a hom homogeneity starting to happen on the, yeah. on the video side where it just looks a little less DIY. Um, so I, I'm seeing a lot more creators like pay good money for an actual, you know, um, videographer to do a, a, a good video. Not dissimilar from like Airbnb. You can see, you can tell there's listings now that are like clearly like the rooms are well lit. The descriptions are, are well written. They might have an aerial drone shot of their property. Yes. Like, yeah. A hundred percent. That's exactly, exactly. Where you just know, like they dialed it, you know. And because of that, you kind of have to be dialed or else you kind of are losing your footing a little bit, I think. Yeah. So there's some sort of balance you've got to strike. Like, um, you know, when I was going through kind of writing the script for our video, it's like you have to strike this balance of like being very obviously still a startup, like garage startup, which is what we are, right? Um, because you don't want them thinking with a polished video, what a lot of people start to think is maybe it's just a product you bought from China and you're reselling it or something, you know? Uh -huh. um, so, so you can't be too polished, but you also want to show that, you know, um, they can rely on you to send them a finished product <laughs> um, after they sent you their money uh, and that you know like the trends you know that you're on trend um, it just there's just like some important sort of markers that it kind of signals it throws out um, so there's a fine balance there that you don't want to look too professional um, and then uh, just as far as what needs to happen a lot of things need to happen it's crazy so um, they, they have had a couple of Kickstarters that have gone off the rails in that like people have, you know, raised a couple million dollars and then they haven't been able to finish the pro product or, or, you know, just like the product, the manufacturing process maybe hasn't gone how they wanted it to. Um, and so they've slipped on their deadlines. And so now Kickstarter does require you to have a prototype. Um, and so we will have a prototype in hand, um, uh, you know, for the February launch. We just have a personal goal of like not delivering any less than six, any more than six months out after the Kickstarter. Mm. So that's really our goal is like, you know, uh, not, you know, to keep it within between June and September delivery for a February launch. A lot of what we're doing ahead of time is, and, and sort of the things that are unknowns that we have to answer to feel comfortable and confident in launching, you know, and, and having a serious launch um, are A, you know, does it, is this AI Melody Maker really worth its weight in gold? Like, do people feel like it gets them so unstuck so quickly that it's magic? Like, that's, yeah. that's what we want to happen. Um, if we can't do that, which we're, we have our alpha test in the next two to three weeks, um, we won't feel comfortable launching until we have that. I just know, you know, it, it's so important to the product, I think. Um, I mean, so we built the entire design of the hardware around having an AI chip because it's faster, you know. Um, so, so that's one, you know, that's one factor that that we factor in. The other factor is just, you know, can Allison get all of the hardware components she needs? Um, and can they all land around the same time? Or can they all be delivered in a, in, a, in a manner that allows for everything to come together for the product? And basically, now you have to become a supply chain expert on top of yes. a hardware and software engineer. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes. And thankfully she had done that at her last company, thankfully. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, if any one of these things fails, you know, if, if you know, we can't get this, the lithium battery that she's been, you know, researching and that she really wants to have in the product, all set us back on our delivery time. So those are really, really important to get right. And so that's what she's working on right now. So I would say like the supply chain hardware design is what she's focusing on. And then the second part is the magic of the Melody Maker feature. The rest, the user interface is difficult, but we don't, 
we don't think it's going to be a game change. It, well, how do I say this? It's not, it's, it's not a make or break for us because we can keep iterating on that. And we, we, we're pretty sure we can get to something that's workable on that end. Um, the hardware piece and the feature, the AI feature are really special. And if those aren't special, then, then I think that, um, frankly, I don't think it would be worth it for us to actually deliver the product. Um, so yeah, so those are the two things that we're really focused on leading up to uh, the campaign. We have an idea, like I said earlier, about how tutor portion of the, of the songwriting companion will work. Um, the notifications, there's some kind of like, you know, unique little features where we have, you know, our logo is very bright pink. We have like a pink light that will go off when, you know, it will blink on the device when, you, when a collaborator has sent over files. So not unlike, um, remember when you got mail, AOL, when we had AOL accounts, you know, you got, Certainly yeah, so I it's do. a similar feature to that where you're kind of trained to, you know, look over at your device and see if, if somebody had sent something over. Um, and then, uh, so there's that collaboration piece that, that is also part of the user interface. Um, and that, that's interesting too, because we're going to have to build that out, I think, after the launch, but that will be something where we're going to have to make sure that people that don't have a Lumos device can still collaborate with bandmates who do. So that'll look like something, you know, uh, so maybe a lighter version, a lighter software version on the desktop uh, where they can, you know, maybe pay a small subscription price for it, a uh, fee for it, or, um, uh, or maybe even a free, you know, it's a free download and, and, and it has limited features. Um, do you mind me asking, do you, do you envision a world where the software itself lives in other devices where you license it or you power other devices with the software? That's a great question. Um, I know of a couple companies that are already doing that with, um, you know, with AI songwriting sort of software. Um, mm. For us, I think we prefer to have our expertise be in the hardware. So like, like an ideal outcome would be say being acquired by Apple or somebody like that, where they're like, yeah. you know, we have Apple music. We're trying to compete with Spotify. We're trying to compete with these others. Um, we want to get closer to the creators. You guys have, you know, whatever, 500,000 creators and all of their music is in your device, you know, that's, um, exciting. that's sort of an, that's sort of the end game for us, right? That would be an awesome end game. Um, or just to keep creating really nice hardware. I mean, you know, our, our inspiration comes from a company called Moog and, um, mm -hmm. you know, they've been able to create just really high quality hardware, um, music hardware for, you know, a couple decades now. And, um, and, you know, they run, you know, it's, Kind of mom and pop still you know their, their employees really love working for them and um they're very ethical and um yeah we would love to you know even if it doesn't you know we don't go big and sell like you know we're used to in the startup world like just having a company that that builds you know really high quality products hardware products that that help musicians would be a dream for us you know do you know enough yet to uh, to speculate on price point, or do you have a price point you're designing towards? Yeah, we are. Um, it's going to be, and we're comparing it to, there's a couple, there's an Electron device. Um, there's a couple different devices on the market that Sweetwater sells right now um, that are around the $1,199 mark. Mm. Um and so that would probably be, if we ended up doing um, channel sales, it'll probably be around that mark, $11.99. Um, our Kickstarter, we're, we're, we're doing an interesting thing where, you know, with Kickstarter, normally people have more than one SKU or they have, you know, a lot of like kind of giveaways. We're just doing a thing where we're like, okay, we have one SKU, one device that we're selling. And so the first 50 devices are going to be 55% off. You know, the, the second, you know, 150 devices are going to be, you know, 40% off the retail price, et cetera, et cetera. So basically the earlier you get in, 
the, the lower your price point is. Um, and I don't think, I think in this first run, I don't think anything will go higher than, uh, I think our highest is $8.99. Mm -hmm. So that would be the highest price, I think, in the last week or so of the campaign. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I want to make sure I get in early because I'm very intrigued and I want to play with one. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Will the um, will the will the software be updatable? Is it like a firmware type thing? Yes. Or like as the AI gets yes. better, I I can plug into my laptop and download. Yes. So so we are we are really big fans of 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 sort of extinguishing this idea of planned obsolescence. Like, I hate nothing more. I'm totally that person that has my phone until it go, gets so slow that I ha have to update it, you know? Yeah. Um, so we're building it for like a seven to nine years life cycle. Um, so you will be able to update the firmware and you'll be able to update the software, of course. Um, but most devices, they don't let you update the firmware. So the firmware updates will be kind of a special thing. Um, we're also building, we're building it in such a way that we know down the road, we're going to use features as it evolves, as the device evolves, um, but they won't be utilized yet. So, um, so like, for example, we had a decision to make a couple uh, days ago, which was, you know, do we use the, t the simple barrel jack that you have as a charger in most of your musical, most of your synthesizers have them. Um, they're inexpensive parts wise, um, or do we use U USB-C, which is, you know, what a lot, you know, the switch has it now actually the Nintendo switch. Um, my laptop is powered with it. Um, and so it's a lot more complex though, right? Because the USB-C has the ability to charge other devices with your device. So like my laptop can charge my phone, right? Um, with the barrel jack, you can't do that. So um, what that makes Allison's job a lot more complicated when she's building the hardware um, because it is so complex. Um, so, you know, we had to weigh the pros and cons of that, you know, it's going to be longer. So what we decided in the end was it's going to be longer upfront work for her to, to build a USB C. Um, charger. Uh, but in the long term, we know that the world is going in that direction and that everything will have USB-C eventually. And so for us, we don't want the qual we don't want to sacrifice the quality over the long term. Yeah. Yeah. And it would make sort of uh, V1 of the device obsolete much faster, or certainly it would feel, yes. it wouldn't feel modern. Yeah. Yes. It wouldn't feel modern. Exactly. And that's the same thing too, for our dials, right? Like when you touch a Moog synthesizer, you, you turn the dials. Um, funny story before we knew what we were going to be developing. Um, uh, we were at a conference, like the biggest music conference in the world in LA in um, January. And um and we walked around to every single booth that had any hardware at all, including even if it was amp, an amp. Um, so not just synthesizers or, you know, recording equipment or, uh, but anything that had hardware and, and it had knobs essentially. <laughs> and yeah. we tested everybody's knobs. We just like, we would just go around and, and I have a video of us just, you know, um, testing knobs, testing knobs. Um, there's that certain so resistance that you get. Like there's a certain yes. feel that is just when you get that and it feels of the right pressure, right? Resistance. It feels so high quality. And when that's not yes. there and it spins too freely, it feels so cheap. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. And so there's all these special words for it, like action and all these different technical terms for it. But but it's the same for knobs and buttons, right? Like it's like your keys and your keyboard, right? Um, and so we really, really, really want to get those right. And so that that's part of our sort of obsession is how do we make products that feel that good for that long, you know? Um, you know, if we want the longevity of this project product to be seven to nine years, you know, it has to feel quality for that long. And so, I mean, I think of, you know, we're, 
And that's about, we always have a Land Rover car. Like one of our cars is always a Land Rover. And our other car is a Volkswagen. And our motorcycles are Ducatis, right? Like there's reasons for those things. The Ducati, the sound is unlike any other motorcycle, right? Land Rover, you just, you can feel the quality, um, yeah. especially off-road. You can, you know, Volkswagen, same thing. The German engineering, on the, especially on the interiors, is just impeccable. Um, the way the doors close, you know, that noise it makes. Um, so we're really big nuts around like product design. And so for us, it's not just about this product being very usable and indispensable to the songwriter, but, but, you know, anybody could come along that isn't a songwriter, hold this device and know, you know, that it was designed properly and that, you know, um, very thoughtfully. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's important. So yeah, that's, um, that's sort of the goal. <laughs> Well, I have a ton more I want to ask you about, but um, I know our time is sort of coming to an end. I, I wonder if I could extend an advance invitation and ask if maybe you'd come back when you launched the Kickstarter and you could tell yes. me about what the, um, what the challenges were that, to get to the last mile, because I suspect yeah. despite your very upbeat, positive demeanor, there's a lot of work between here and there. Yeah, here and then. Yeah. And I'd love to hear about how you get um how you get to the screen of, of being launched live and then yeah. maybe talk a little bit about um some of the things we didn't get to, how how you wound up where you are today, why Reno. Um there's yeah. a lot I'd love yeah, to learn yeah, about yeah. the two of you. Um so uh I'd like to extend the offer so that when 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 the Kickstarter's up, I'd love to have you back. Oh, we would love that. That would be excellent. Yeah, and it's so fun to talk to you about this. Thank you, Ethan Clift and Allison Clift Jennings from Tonic Audio Labs. Thank you, Macy McCollum from Rock, Paper, Scissors for making this conversation happen. Thanks to Ant Taylor and the entire team at Light. If you want to learn more about Light, visit light.com. That's L-Y-T-E dot com. And thank you for listening to Spotlight On. We're available from Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and pretty much anywhere else you get podcasts from. Please keep your feedback coming. Hit me up at lp at light.com. Thank you so much. Be safe and stay in touch. Get up, get